Today I want to talk just for a few moments about us, about the church, because uh, there is nothing more beautiful, more potent, more incredible than the local church that is really just functioning so well that God himself just loves to be present with us, but that others love to be present with us. Have you noticed how even Jesus' enemies could not bear to be away from him? My mother always used to say, if you can't get on, you obviously didn't have a mother like mine. <laughs> My mother said, well, how about if you can't say anything nice? Okay. If you can't leave, you know, each other alone? That's right. Yes. In silence. You know, leave one alone. Go away. But the Pharisees can't leave Jesus alone. They have to be where he is. You know, and, and it feels a little bit like sort of digging, but it's actually it's more than that. Because it's, the clue is with Nicodemus when he turns up to Jesus in John chapter 3 and he says, we know that God is with you. That's what irritated them more than anything else. They knew that God was with them. I had a guy who came into a uh, uh, vineyard one Sunday morning and I said, hi, how are you doing? He says, uh, hi, I said, my name's Wes. He said, I'm Noel. I said, morning, Noel. I said, uh, is this your first time? He says, yeah. He says, but I've been afraid to come. So I said, oh, you know, I just started thinking, mm, gosh, what have I done? I automatically think I, I did something, you know. I said, oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, why is that? He said, because people say that God is here. And I was afraid to come. And I looked at him and I said, you know, Noel, there are times when it, I'm afraid to come as well. Not that I'm not loved and cared for, but that God is in the house. And Paul writes to the Philippian church, this Roman um, enclave, this place where being a Christian wasn't easy. And he writes them, and you can get just in the, in the few verses before the passage that was read to us, it comes out of this thing of saying, you know, this same thing that you have seen and experienced of me, this imprisonment, this opposition. And he says, and I know that you've had it as well. And so he calls to them, and he says, live up to this thing that God has given you. And he starts to talk about being the church, being of one heart and mind. So I did um, a couple of little things for this. The church of God, what do you think? <laughs> I love this moment in The Simpsons when Grandad is having an apoplectic fit in the carpet just to the uh, right of Homer. And he's flicking through the Bible and he's saying, why does this book have no answers? as he's flicking through. Mind you, there is this bit as well. And the Reverend Timothy Lovejoy and Ned Flanders. Is that church? Is that Christianity? Or how about this one? You can never go wrong with the vicar of... Mind you, I did think about playing this morning, that's not my vicar. <laughs> For all the grandparents who have played the game... I thought I could get pictures of famous, you know, and say, no, it's not my vicar. He's too fluffy. Or he's too this or that. Or you have this one. Is the church the malicious, secretive society? No, no I'm not talking about the Anglican church. I'm just talking about the, the church generally. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. Well, <laughs> play with me. They're alive now. But what does it look like? Well, people often will tell you that the church is like a concert and they come to be entertained or amused. Whether cathedrals or small chapels or here, they sit there and, and say, wow me. You know, I think sometimes in charismatic churches, the first song we often sing in our hearts is, bah, 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 you shake my nerves and you rattle my brain. Because that's in a sense what we're asking for. But then sometimes we think the church is like a school. And it says, equip me, educate me, make me smarter about Christianity. And actually, theologians become smarter at Christianity. They don't know more, they just become smarter about Christianity. Or we might say that it's a social club or an interest group. And it has people just like me. 
be quite something else. But you know, very often, churches have people just like me. And of course, when we ask God to move and draw people in and change people's lives or whatever, and he does, and he brings people who aren't like us. Because that's the extent of his grace and his love. He reaches out to people who don't have right theology, who don't know when to sit and stand, including me. I got it wrong this morning. I went to the pulpit during matins, during the singing of the, the second hymn. Yeah, I know, I know, like, you know, I, I felt a cannon going off somewhere. <laughs> but after we think, but when Jesus starts to come to his house, he brings whoever he likes. He brings people who don't look or dress or sound or talk like us, who don't pray like us, who don't get it like us, but they get him. And do you know what I've discovered? That Jesus gets to invite whoever he likes to his own home. And he doesn't need our permission. But the church as a social club, there, there are loads of people meeting this morning around here doing other things, from knitting to bridge to sports or whatever. But they're not the church. They're, they're, they're meeting on Sunday. But to be the church, it's something else. Of course, the other thing that the church can be is a department store. And we become consumers. We say, I tell you what, give me God how I want, when I want, at a price I want to pay for him. And, and that's, you know, <clears throat> have you ever gone home and said, I got nothing out of the service this morning? Um, no, 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 please don't nod. Because <laughs> you never have. But to the people who have occasionally said that to me, I've said, you may not have got anything. Did you give anything? Did you give yourself in worship and in offering and humility and support? The thing I love about black Pentecostal churches is if the preacher's not doing good, you know it. And if you're the preacher, you know it. Because some old lady at the back goes, help him, Jesus! And you know this is not going well today. If they say glory, you know you're doing all right for the time being. All right, fine. <laughs> glory. And we go to a department store because we want to say, serve me. Improve my life. Make me feel better on the inside about me. And of course, the way that we feel better on the inside about us is to feel better on the inside about him. That's the, how it, that's the economy. That's how it works. Of course, the other thing is the church is a bit like a hospital. And we say, care for my needs and my hurts. Smooth me. Soothe me. Indulge me. Love me. And all of those things are part of being the family of God. Absolutely. We get to do all of those things. But what is it that we are? Because this is the truth, I guess. The church is not a building. You agree with that? Absolutely. Church wardens absolutely want to agree with that. The church is definitely, okay. But actually, we often then say, but the church is not the people either. Because there are lots of people meeting on Sunday doing other things, and they're not calling themselves church. Because the church isn't the building and the church isn't the people. The church is the people with the presence of God. You have to have the presence of God to be church. I've often wondered whether the Apostle Paul would wander in at a meeting that I was leading on a Sunday morning and afterwards take me to one side, may I have a word, brother? And just say, Wes, I've no idea what you are, but you aren't the church that we bled and died for in the first century. Or he might come and say, come on guys, ramp it up. Let's get on with this. The church is not the building. The church is not the people. The church is the people with the presence of God. You have to have the head to be a live body. Otherwise, you are a corpse. A body without a head is a corpse. And so that's part of the journey that we have. And Paul writes this church and he says, you've got to be of one heart and one mind about this in order not only to survive the things that you're going through but to live and function as the people of God so that people wouldn't it be great can you imagine a Sunday when people are queuing up 
outside to get in. I, look, I know I've just announced a miracle to some of you, but just come with me for a minute. Can you, how about this? Can you imagine arriving at church as was the custom and not being able to sit in your seat? Now, I know you don't have a seat. That's because nobody else is allowed to sit in it and it's always vacant. But what happens if you come and one Sunday morning, the place is so full that Jeremy has to say, look, would you mind just going having the second service in the, which rooms are they? Those rooms. I've never known which bloke it's, it's named after, but I know it's in the Bible somewhere. Um, can you imagine saying, would you mind coming back later on? Because there isn't, we, we had meetings where we had to say, excuse me, could, could the church members just get up and, and vacate their seats so visitors could get in? And to be the church, to be the place that God is in the house, where his presence is with us, where you don't have to say, is God here? From the moment you walk through the door, you know he's here. Not because somebody's told you, but because something has so gripped your spirit that you don't need it explained to you. You have it already. So in this little um, thing here, the church is first of all a spiritual creation before it is a social construction. Okay, just follow me with that. The church is something that was birthed in the heart of God before you got to organize it down here. We get to do this because he dreamt it up. He said, let the church look like the Trinity. Now, I know we're Anglicans, so you're not going to do it, but just if you took a look around at the people next to you, they're supposed to remind you of the Trinity. If you're married to that person, be very affirming right now. <laughs> because God said, let us make man in our own image, and he did. And then he let us live like he does. And he said, let's call it church. Let's get everybody together. I often wonder how Jesus got 12 disciples. And I, want, I mean, not that I ever would, because it seems un, inappropriate, but I would say, Jesus, how did you ever expect it to work? Have you never read, led a house group? <laughs> have, you, have you never been on a PCC? Have you, how did you ever expect that these people with such different backgrounds were ever going to get on? And Jesus says, just trust me. I've been doing this for a while. And he puts us together that we might together, collectively, embrace and embody the presence of God. So as people walk in, they don't just get a hymn book and a sheet and a thing. As they walk in, as they walk on the property that belongs to the church, however theologically you take that phrase, that they already begin to sense that he is here. So in that process, I just wanted to float just a few things to you about the church, and then I'm going to close in prayer. The first one is this, that churches that are growing do not only have growing leaders, and they certainly do. They have leaders who are studying and reading and, and praying and trying to understand how this all holds together. But churches that are growing not only have growing leaders, they have growing people as well. Like a mighty tortoise moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where we've always trod. We are so divided. Many bodies, we. Do you, the idea that you got saved or you met God and that was the end of it, Folks, that was just the beginning. As God increases our understanding, our relationship, and our love with him. So just these quick things. The first one is this, that every, uh, in, in, in growing churches, every person is a child of grace. We all need help from heaven. Tell that to the person next to you. I need help from heaven. On your way out, obviously. We all need help. There isn't a perfect church. I have made some spectacular cock-ups. I, I worked out that I was just going to make all my mistakes in public. 
Okay? Other people get to make their mistakes in private. No, no. I, I was going to make them in, in public. You know, when it went wrong, it really went wrong, and people would know it went wrong. But every child is a child of grace. We all need help from heaven. And whether you stand at the front or you do something else, you need help from heaven. And we need to remember that in our remembering of one another. We all need help. All ministry is grace. Ministry means that God is using people that he really shouldn't, including you and including me. The second thing is this, that everyone is significant, but not everyone is prominent. Slight difference between those two things. Some people get to make a fool of themselves dressing up at the front and doing other things, but actually that doesn't mean that they're more significant than other people. Human history and the history of the church is going to look very different when you get to heaven. Because you're going to look around for people and they're not there. And then you're going to look at some people and think, how the heck did you get in? And the people, in fact, John Wesley um, had a great spat with George Whitfield. It was about the, appro- the, the appropriateness of preaching in the open air, which Wesley thought was disgraceful. God only ever went to church. And then Whitfield got thrown out of the church, and so he preached in the marketplaces. And what really annoyed Wesley is that God didn't appear to mind that because he turned up. And then, of course, Wesley then went out and preached in the marketplaces. And so during the course of their spat, um, a journalist came to John Wesley and said, uh, Reverend Wesley, do you expect to see the Reverend Whitfield in heaven? And he said, absolutely not. He said, because he will be at the front and I will be towards the very back. And you know, significance and prominence aren't the same thing. Not everybody is visible, but everybody makes a difference in a church that God is present in. The third thing is this, that everyone is valued and all are listened to. Everybody is valued. Everybody is valued and all are listened to. But even though all are listened to, not all are agreed with. Do you like that? No. Think about it. I'm having this discussion with a church leader, and they're telling me very strongly what they think about a particular issue. And I clearly equivocated, like, hmm. He said, no, 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 let me explain it. And he did. But he just raised his voice a little bit more to give it more Holy Spirit anointing in the process of doing it, you see. And at the end, he finished, and I went, hmm. And he said, Wes, you're not listening to me. And I said, I am listening to you. It's just that I don't agree with you. And as we share our stories, we have to understand that, yes, we can be heard. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody agrees with us. In fact, God doesn't agree with me a lot of the time. But he still lets me get on. And so everybody is valued. And people are valued for who they are, not for what they do. Have you ever been asked to do children's work? Do you remember that? Could you just cover this week for us? Because so-and-so's away. And 14 years later, you're still... We need to value people for who they are, not for what they do. Everyone takes responsibility for themselves and others. You are responsible for the quality of your discipleship. It's nobody else. The church, your friends, your neighbors, they all participate, but you are responsible for it. You know, you're not going to be able to get to heaven and say, God, Christianity wasn't really very good for me, and it was Jeremy's fault. Okay? Because actually the truth is we're all responsible for the quality of our own lives. Nobody can do your praying for you. Nobody can do your listening to God for you. Nobody can do your fasting for you. Well, I suppose you could really get somebody else to do that for you. No, okay. But the interesting thing about it is this. We're not only responsible for ourselves, the quality of our own lives, we're responsible for the quality of other people's lives as well. Because everybody in this church is a pastor. In the sense that everybody gets to look after everybody. If you see somebody who's, you know, you think not doing so well, don't pass by and leave it to somebody else. We're all in this together. And that's why Paul writes to the Philippians and says, be of one heart and one mind. Be in this together. Do this together. If you see someone struggling, don't leave them. If somebody needs encouragement, give it to them. 
Have you ever had those moments when you think, do you know, I really ought to phone so-and-so. Just, just do a thing. And you put it off. And you put it off. And then later on you find that it was the right thing. We're all pastors. We all do this together. Somebody have, someone has titles and, and jobs and they oversee a thing, but we all do this together. Everyone has a purpose. I was going to put everyone has a fit, but I thought that might give the... the yeah, you've had that already. Okay. Every, all can find a fit, a place where who God has made them to be. And if, if for you, you're at that moment in life when you say, the, please don't say the only thing I can do is pray. Okay. Could you please put that first? Say the most important thing I can do is pray. Because everybody fits somewhere. Everybody has a place somewhere. You are so unique that nobody can do what you can do because of the presence of God. And the final thing is this. Everyone carries the weight. We all carry the weight for the life and health of the church. Some people are more responsible and accountable for it, but we all carry responsibility for it. We're all responsible for the prayer life we're all responsible for sharing and participating and giving. We're all responsible for taking responsibility to help out and do things. One of the uh, guys who mentored Mary and I for quite a few years used to say this. He says, the kingdom of God is not about rights. It's about responsibilities. The kingdom of God is not about rights. It's about responsibilities. Responsibilities to God, responsibilities to one another, and responsibilities to the world that we are trying to bring into a loving connection with the Lord Jesus. If everyone carries the weight, no one waits for things to happen. Nobody sits there in a meeting and says, okay, come on, impress me, wow me, do something for me. Make, me, make my Christian life sparkle and shine today. Everybody says, let me get involved with this. And that's what Paul writes to the Philippian church. Because he talks about a Jesus who takes, and for the you theologians you can take this away, who takes seven human steps down before God gives him seven steps up to exalt him. And he lays aside his deity, his right to use divine power. And he comes down among us and says, be of one heart and one mind. And there is, a, there is debate among theologians about what Jesus is doing in the waters of baptism. Uh, because he's not uh, being cleansed of sin because he hasn't got any. Um, they say he's identifying with sinners, which is true. But he identified with sinners every day of his ministry. And he will do that on the cross. So they're saying, what, what's he doing? Oh, and I have a sneaking feeling it's this. As he leaves the throne, he lays aside the vestiges of deity. And as he comes into the waters of baptism, he lays aside the vestiges of humanity, of the flesh. And he says, I'm not going to live this life because I'm God, and I'm not going to live this life out of the power of the flesh. And then the Holy Spirit says, now's the moment. A life that is laid down is a life that the Spirit fills. And so he writes, Paul writes to the church and says, come on, let's be of one heart and mind. We all have a place in this. We all have a place in the presence and we all have a place in the Spirit. So let us pray.